and welcome to Facing Future TV. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm a climate lawyer and activist. How can we tame the methane monster? To discuss this, I'm joined today by Dr. Bob Howarth. He is a, the David R. Atkinson Professor of Ecology and Environmental Biology at Cornell University. Without further ado, welcome, Bob. Welcome, Dr. Howarth. Thank you, Raya. It's great to be with you today. If you could help, um, help me and help us understand you know, the threat of methane. Yeah, methane's the second most important greenhouse gas, and it, it's uh, it's people just don't think about it anywhere near as much as they do carbon dioxide, and that's fine. Carbon dioxide is the is the most important greenhouse gas, but methane's important. If we look at the warming uh, to date, you know, human activities warmed the planet by a little bit over one degree Celsius so far, one point one almost 1.2 degrees Celsius, enough that we're seeing major climate disruptions from that warming. Uh, of that warming, uh, 0.75 degrees is coming from carbon dioxide and 0.5, which isn't that much less, is coming from methane. And if you're good with math, you'll add those up and it's a little bit more warming than we've observed. That's because sulfur pollution is cooling the earth a little bit too. Bottom line is uh, we would be nowhere near as warm as we are today if it were not for, for that methane. The most recent science from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, they did their first major uh, global update to the synthesis uh, released last summer, and they now very, very much highlight methane and the need to, to do more on methane. One of the issues is that, you know, both the uh, Carbon dioxide and methane are, are, are critical greenhouse gases, but they operate on different time scales. The carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere today will continue to have some influence for centuries to come, perhaps uh, even a thousand years into the future, because it's taken up by the oceans and forests and it's re released and stays with us. Methane has a half life in the atmosphere of only about a dozen years or so. So, of the methane that we're putting in now, most of it will be dissipated completely in the time period of 70 to 80 years. So, it's a, while it's in the atmosphere, it's 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide. There's less of it in the atmosphere and it doesn't hang around as long. So, they're both critical greenhouse gases, but they're operating with different intensities and, and different time scales. How do we account for methane and why does that matter? Well, you know, methane's a, you know, it's a colorless, odorless gas, right? You can't see it, you can't smell it. And that means historically it's been difficult to get good measures of, of, of the concentration, but, but also the, the sources and where it's coming from. And it comes from multiple sources. You know, some of it's coming from natural sources, principally wetlands and freshwater lakes, but most of it now is, is coming from human activity, but a bunch of different human activities. It's coming from coal mining, coming from the oil and gas industry for sure. It's coming from animal agriculture. Cows burp a fair amount of methane. Rice agriculture produces methane. Uh, wastewater treatment plants produce it. Landfills produce it. And we have a bunch of tools we can use. We can look at time trends and we can look at spatial distributions over the planet. We also have some chemical signals. You know, methane is a very simple molecule. It's one carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms around it, but they're there are different uh, isotopes of, of carbon. The relative uh, amount of those in the atmosphere uh, gives us uh, information as to where the methane is coming from. Uh, why don't we go ahead and, and, and turn to how, to how some of this has played out in your work um, in New York. New York, we have our landmark 2019 um, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, some of the nation's um, most robust um, goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I know that you worked quite closely with the state in determining how that accounting mechanism would, you know, would be used in particular with regard to methane. The, the language which is in the bill it passed is I helped write going way back to 2016 or so. The issue is, well, it's twofold. It's the time frame over which you account for methane. And it's also the spatial boundaries which we consider. So let me deal with the time frame first. Historically, uh, greenhouse gas accounting has looked at methane on the time frame of 100 years after it's emitted. So you get a pulse of methane and we look at the cumulative effect for 100 years into the future in comparison to carbon dioxide. And, and that is sort of enshrined in the Kyoto Protocol from 1992, but the science behind it was always pretty weak. I and others have been arguing for a better part of a decade now that 20 years is a better time frame. Uh, it, it more realistically captures what methane actually does for the time it's in the atmosphere. 
most of the climatic warming that's occurred that we're concerned about has happened in the last 30 years. You know, we're not, this didn't just creep up slowly over 200 years. It's a recent phenomenon. And we're trying to keep the planet below 1.5 degrees of warming. We're at 1.1, 1.2. We're in a trajectory to hit that target in 10, 12, 15 years from now. So averaging it all out 100 years into the future uh, hugely underplays the importance of methane. So the time frame is important. And the CLCPA uh, mandates that the 20-year time frame be used. So that's one aspect. The other is geography. And traditionally, when one does a greenhouse gas inventory, you look just at the emissions which occur within your boundaries. So within the state of New York, in our case. And it, on the face of it, that's logical. Why would you be looking elsewhere? But the issue is, you know, in New York, uh, we're particularly sensitive to the issue, I think. We, we banned fracking in the state, right? We don't develop shale gas in the state. And there's good reasons for that. But we import a huge amount of, of uh, fracked shale gas, mostly yeah. from Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, West Virginia. Uh, there are large methane emissions associated with that. But most of those methane emissions don't happen in New York. We're the ones using the fuel, but they happen where the gas is produced and processed and where it starts to be transported. So they're, they're happening in Pennsylvania. And the CLCPA says we in New York will take responsibility in our greenhouse gas accounting for emissions, no matter where they occur, if they're associated with our use of energy. And that's a game changer because, you know, the carbon dioxide emissions from using fracked gas are low compared to coal. So it looks like, you know, people talked about it as a bridge fuel for a while. Right, that language right. has gone away. If you include the methane emissions, uh, the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas is worse than that of coal. And if we just look at those emissions in New York, you, you miss that. You have to you have to understand what's going on in Pennsylvania to support our use of our addiction to that fracked gas. So I, I think that's a a huge game changer and very important. It's actually a, a bigger difference than the than the time frame in terms of uh, shifting the the result. It's it's important when we look at uh, the overall inventories because using the traditional approach where we only looked at emissions within New York, and we looked at methane over a hundred year time period, methane ended up being about, oh, 1% or so of our total greenhouse gas inventory. And the number one uh, industry would be transportation. When we use this new accounting and we take full responsibility for methane, methane is now about 30% of our greenhouse gas inventory. And the number one source of emissions is the heating of our homes and our commercial buildings. It's our use of natural gas. So it fundamentally changes how you look at it. it is it fair to say that that the CLCPA and that New York is relatively unique? You know, no, no other states are doing this, uh, but I think they will. I, mean, I know uh, Vermont is, is considering it, Massachusetts. I expect that other states will come along as they start to, to see the wisdom of this. And and uh, the European Union has been uh, considering some of these changes as well. What are some of the, either the national or global implications of, of looking at this, this new accounting? Yeah, well, well, again, you know, methane is responsible for half a degree of the warming we've had to date. And most, most of the warming we've seen to date is over the last 30 years. Again, we're trying to keep the planet 1.5 degrees below that uh, pre-industrial threshold. So methane alone has driven us a third of the way to that target. And the good news, the good and bad news about methane is it's uh, it, it's an extremely powerful greenhouse gas. It doesn't stay in the atmosphere that long. So if we can if we can reduce our emissions, it has a really rapid response. You know, if you were to start to reduce carbon dioxide emissions now, there's a lag in the climate system of about uh, 30 years before you really start to slow warming. You reduce methane emissions now, you slow global warming now. And the, the, the best science on that, there's a report that came out uh, last spring, uh, led by Drew Schindel, professor at Duke University, who I think is the world's leading expert in this. He led an effort for the United Nations Environmental Program, and, and they estimated that uh, globally, humans could relatively easily cut methane emissions by about 45% uh, in this decade, by the end of this decade, and that to do so would slow the rate of uh, global warming by about... Uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees uh, Celsius by the time we came to 2040. So it, that's a cost-effective approach. Paying attention to methane really does matter. And, and in terms of governments that get here, you know, again, New York is on the forefront of, of paying attention to this. 
is this is fascinating and I'm I'm understanding that it's both, you know, like a fearsome a fearsome thing to understand, you know, how big this problem is, but that it also presents in a way, if we focus on the sector, some real near-term opportunities. This again makes me think of how are we going to tame this monster in particular regard to the energy sector? The fossil gas industry has been using this idea that I think is very much in the popular understanding that natural gas is cleaner burning and is something that is a tool to help us achieve um, emissions reductions. What is your your view on that? I personally think we should just be moving away from using gas and all other fossil fuels as quickly as possible. And I think that's the most effective way to solve this problem. And that's, you know, that's what the CLCPA uh, mandates for New York. Um, and and that, that sort of gets me to my, uh, my next um, couple of questions in terms of solutions that are being proposed. There's this idea of hydrogen as a solution green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. I know this is something that you've worked on. Could you explain, help help us understand what is green hydrogen, what is blue hydrogen, and why does this yes. matter? Yeah, no, it's a really uh, interesting topic. And, and to, to be honest, I had never heard of blue hydrogen until uh, you and I were on the Climate Action Council, and I started hearing people suggest that blue hydrogen might be part of our solution. You know, we should move away from fossil gas, and perhaps we should replace it with this blue hydrogen. So I started, uh, oh, after the, about the summer of, of 2020, uh, into the fall of 2020, I started, you know, asking uh, expert colleagues what they knew about blue hydrogen and its greenhouse gas footprint and looking myself for the literature and, uh, and, you know, all of my colleagues said they didn't know anything about it. And, and you look at the literature and there, there really was absolutely no literature. So industry was promoting this blue hydrogen idea as a a fuel of the future that was either zero emissions or low emissions, depending on who you're listening to. And we'll get, we'll get, Tell us what, what is blue hydrogen? Well, blue no, hydrogen, it's, it's the invention of the public relations folks of the, of the oil and gas industry, to, to, to be blunt. The, the terminology was first originated by the French gas company Air Liquide in 2015, pretty recently. And it started to make its way into uh, the rest of Europe and into English speaking countries in about 2017, 2018. Uh, there's a group called the Hydrogen Council, which has been hugely instrumental in that. And the Hydrogen Council is a, a lobbying group that was first established in 2017 by British Petroleum, uh, French uh, oil giant Total, uh, and others. And they promoted this idea of blue hydrogen. So. Hydrogen, if you look at hydrogen in the world today, 96% uh, of it comes from fossil fuels. And in wow. Europe and in the United States and Canada, it's coming entirely from natural gas. In uh, China, they make hydrogen from coal, but still globally, it's 96% it's, uh, from, from fossil fuels. So it's got a, it has a really large greenhouse gas footprint. The invention of the industry this was this idea of we call that, by the way, gray hydrogen, which, you know, who, who wants to market gray hydrogen? If you make it from coal, it's called brown hydrogen, even harder to market. <laughs> the invention of the industry was to come up with blue hydrogen, which is to take this gray hydrogen and apply car carbon dioxide capture and storage to the carbon dioxide that's emitted when we uh, produce this, this hydrogen from the methane. And so that's why they're saying, you know, it's a low emission, zero emission fuel. The idea is producing hydrogen from natural gas, but you're capturing the carbon dioxide. So, you know, that sounds good. Uh, in the end, there, there was no peer reviewed literature supporting that. In fact, it was a low emissions fuel. So I started you know, taking that on directly as a research challenge, pretty heavily, uh, oh, about a year ago from now, actually not that long ago. And there, there are two issues. One is you can't use natural gas without having some methane escape to the atmosphere. And again, it doesn't happen at the facility. It happens where the gas is being produced and processed and, and transported, et cetera. So when you use this natural gas as your feedstock, it's also your energy source that you burn to produce that high pressure and, and uh, temperature, uh, pressure and temperature to, to, to do it. So you have uh, a lot of use of natural gas there. It's a lot of methane emissions associated with it. And industry is doing nothing to try to reduce that. 
Then you come to the carbon capture. Well, I wasn't really an expert in carbon capture. So I brought in my colleague, Mark Jacobson, who's an engineer at Stanford, who is an expert in it. And he and I co-authored the paper in the end. Uh, bottom line is that there, there are only two facilities where people have ever tried to make this blue hydrogen. And from the carbon dioxide that's that's uh, produced, they are they actually capture uh, in the neighborhood of 85% of that, but some of it's still emitted from the actual breakdown of the methane into hydrogen and carbon dioxide. But of the, of the gas that's burned to produce all of that uh, heat and, and pressure, they haven't even tried to capture it. So overall, there's a huge amount of carbon dioxide that's coming out. And then you look at the possibilities. Carbon dioxide is hard stuff to capture. So you, you look at the power plants where they've tried to do it. The industry norm is if you're capturing 55, 60%, you're doing well. And of course, it takes more energy to do that. <laughs> and there's more emissions associated. And we went through the accounting and determined that the greenhouse gas footprint of this blue hydrogen is actually worse than if you were to simply burn natural gas or, or coal, in fact. So it's not a low emissions fuel. It's, uh, it's public relations. It's, it's greenwashing, quite frankly. It's a way to make it seem like you're cleaning up the problem with fossil gas and you're actually aggravating it. What I'm hearing is clearly a global fossil fuel industry seeking to stay in business by... Right. It's almost replicating the, you know, the clean coal idea that we knew was green. It's, it's like the clean coal idea. It's like the gas as a bridge fuel idea. And you know, those, those ideas are all passe, but this is the latest invention. Yeah, we have blue hydrogen. And you know, it, it's, it's, it's misleading beyond what I've even said, because there's an implication that you can put this stuff into the gas distribution systems and use that pipelines and people can continue to use it into the future. And that's just not true. The, you can mix a little bit of hydrogen in with natural gas and the existing pipeline systems, say we would have here in New York State, but not, not more than 10, 20, maybe 30%, no more than that, it's too corrosive. It would break down the pipes. So you simply can't do it. You still mostly have to use fossil gas in the system. And also as you increase the hydrogen, you know, your, your gas furnace, your gas stove, your gas water heater aren't designed to handle that. Right. So the, you, you would need to get a new furnace, a new water heater, a new stove if you actually went to a high amount of hydrogen. And, you know, they they are very misleading in how they promote that. They make it seem like these are it. interchangeable yeah. fuels. They're not. What were the what were the implications? I know that your your work on that blue hydrogen issue got a lot of attention. And like you said, didn't seem like there was a lot in the literature. And I think the, the fossil industry was kind of getting away with promoting this narrative. What were the implications of of kind of exposing what was going on there? How well, how is this news? Our, our paper only came out last August, which is pretty recent. Uh, and there's a lot of momentum uh, that industry has, has gotten going behind this idea of blue hydrogen. So as it turns, I wasn't aware of this until our paper came out, but I, I really annoyed a huge number of people in the United Kingdom in particular because they were just coming out with their new 10-year energy plan to meet climate goals and all in advance of COP26, right? And it, blue hydrogen plays a big role in that because it's zero emissions or low emissions, right. they, they said. And, you know, their, their report was coming out the same week that our paper was published that, you know, they there's like kicking a hornet's nest. They they were really really mad at me over that. Uh, there's also a fair amount of momentum in the European Union for mm. forces that think that maybe blue hydrogen has a role, and that's still kind of playing out. And there's some in the United States. You know the uh, the quote unquote bipartisan infrastructure bill that that passed in the fall uh, gives pretty big subsidies to to blue hydrogen. I I hope. Uh, there really isn't much scientific debate about what we've done. You know, people were annoyed, but other scientists are looking at it and go, well, yeah. And we, you know, there, there are input assumptions. We, we, we make the assumption that three and a half percent of the natural gas that's developed escapes unburned as methane. That's well supported by science, but some people think it could be less, some people more. Uh, and in terms of the carbon capture of the, the gas that you're burning, we assume for our default assumption that 65% uh, of the carbon dioxide could be captured. Uh, industry says they might be able to get to 90. They've never demonstrated that. But we did a sensitivity analysis saying, okay, you can do 90. And okay, you can reduce methane emissions down to 1.5%. And it's still worse than natural gas. You know, So it's, our conclusions are quite robust across the range of any reasonable input data you'd want to use. Uh, 
there are a few other papers that are starting to come out now and they'll, you know, they, they quibble a little bit with some of our details, but they're reaching the same conclusions we are. In I, fact. So I, it's a very robust conclusion. And I hope eventually that will have some influence in the policy world, but you know, you're up against very, very powerful, very, uh, very powerful lobbying industry. forces. What's the difference between blue hydrogen and green hydrogen? Okay, well, well blue, blue hydrogen, again, it's just, uh, it's this, misleading marketing thought that you can take fossil fuels and somehow not have methane emissions associated with it and somehow actively capture all that carbon dioxide and you can't. So it's just, it's misleading. It shouldn't be used. It shouldn't be explored. We really are better off just using the fossil gas directly. We really are just that that's the context. Green hydrogen again is the hydrogen that's made from using uh, 100% renewable electricity. So electricity is coming from wind, hydro, solar, and, and then you're electrolyzing water and turning into hydrogen and oxygen. And the you know the greenhouse gas consequences of that are are quite low because it's renewable energy. And the whole process of making the hydrogen is inefficient. So even it's green, truly green, if the energy source is is 100% renewable, but it's still not particularly efficient. So it's not necessarily a good use. So let, let's let's think of, of where it might be good and where it might be bad. And I'll, I'll start with where it's bad. Some are suggesting that we use green hydrogen to, to heat our homes and commercial buildings. Well, that's, that's just really a bad idea because you're taking the renewable uh, electricity you're converting into hydrogen. There's a loss of, of energy associated with that. Then you have to, hydrogen's hard to transport and store. It, it is corrosive. You need really fancy, high quality stainless steel to, to handle it. You can't compress it very easily. That takes a lot of energy. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's not particularly conducive to moving it around. You can't use our existing gas pipeline system. It's not built for that. So you can't really get to people's houses. But let's say you could take care of that all and you could, and you could burn it in something like our current gas furnaces, those still are pretty inefficient. And so you end up, you if you were to do that and the, you solve the transportation problem, at best you'd get about 0.4 units of heat energy for the one unit of electricity that you put into the system to make the hydrogen in the first place. You're losing 60% of the energy. So let me contrast that with using a ground source heat pump, high efficiency, where we're putting in electricity it's extracting heat from the groundwater around the building. And so it actually has an efficiency higher than 100%. People can't possibly be more than that, but it's because you're extracting energy from the environment. So for that one unit of electricity you put into the heat pump, you're getting out four, maybe four and a half units of heat energy. So for the same amount of electricity, you're getting 10 times more heat in your home if you go with a heat pump than if you somehow miraculously used hydrogen. It's just a really bad idea to even go down that that whole track. So that's let's put that behind us. One use uh, for hydrogen, green hydrogen, might be to store electricity. So you know, we the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. We need to store electricity. Uh, when we're producing surplus electricity, why not use it to store hydrogen? And then you can feed the hydrogen back into the electric grid. And if you do it through a fuel cell instead of burning it, then the emissions are fairly low. So it's that's it, that's fine. I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. But we should be very careful to determine that that's the best and most cost-effective way to store the electricity. And there are other things we could do. You can use flywheels that, that store the energy through momentum. You can compress or liquefy air and then feed it back through a turbine and regenerate it. You can pump water and, and store it and run it back. So, so hydrogen is one way we can store renewable electricity and it might be the best, but that really hasn't been demonstrated. And I think we should all have a real open mind and, and go into that. Other uses of hydrogen that people talk about are, are in terms of what we call really hard to decarbonize things. So uh, ship transport or uh, you know jet airplanes. And hydrogen may have a role there, but um, Again, I, I think there's a lot of, there's excessive hype, let me phrase it that way. Uh, I've been paying close attention to this since our paper came out last summer and watching all the response. Hydrogen is essential to do everything. People say, well, that really hasn't been demonstrated. There's a lot, a lot more hype than fact behind it. So let, let's take uh, aviation. Uh, you can't take hydrogen and I mean, you, you can actually take a jet engine and run it on hydrogen instead of jet fuel. That's possible. What you can't do is run a jet airplane on it because 
you can't store enough hydrogen on the airplane to make any difference. Certainly not in the wings where the jet fuel is because you need to liquefy it in order to get enough on board. You'd have to displace all of the passengers in the, in the plane with our current aircraft. So you're talking about designing a totally different type of aircraft if you got to do that. And then people say, well, you could, instead of burning it in the jet engine, you could turn it into electricity using fuel cells and then run electric props or something. And, and that's true. Um, but it's you're probably better off using batteries if you're going to go the electric route. And there are, in fact, electric planes now, and they're they're improving. They're running longer distances. So maybe hydrogen will catch up, but I don't think that's a, a proven fact. So I and and green hydrogen is going to be until we have a surplus of renewable electricity, which is decades into the future. You know, right now we need every drop we have to displace fossil fuels. We need to be really careful how we use that green energy, and we want to make sure that we do so in the most efficient and cost-effective way. And it's it's not clear to me that hydrogen is is going to be that in most cases. It sounds like there are some areas that don't make any sense at all, and there are some areas that could potentially have promise. And there's sort of more of learning and research and cost effectiveness, and you know how beneficial it will be that we need to take really hard looks at. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, you know, I don't want to be overly negative. I, I, I do. I have friends who work on hydrogen research, and they, they say, "Oh, you're being way too negative. Look at this. This might be a good use." And, you know, it might be, but let's let's be careful. What is renewable natural gas? Well, renewable natural gas is is methane, but it's coming not from fossil sources, but rather from uh, uh, biological sources. And I actually support the responsible use of it. But you know, we've done the calculations for the state of New York. And the, if you take the wastewater treatment plants and the landfills, and we also take all of the cow manure and, and make methane out of that, the total amount of methane that you might produce statewide is in the neighborhood of one and a half, two percent 2% of the amount of fossil gas that we currently use. It's a small resource. It doesn't mean we shouldn't use it but we should be careful not to pretend that it's going to replace our use of fossil gas now. And I think industry, uh, I don't know if it's deliberate or not, but they confuse people on that. They, they make it seem like they can continue to use their pipeline infrastructure again with this renewable natural gas. You can't, it's just not a large enough resource. I think, you know, the, the CLCPA is a great law. And if we, if we follow through and, and meet the goals of that law, it's going to just be incredible for our state and we can set an example for the world, but you know, we need to be uh, clear eyed and, and hard nosed about reaching those targets. And we, we shouldn't be misled by what you call false solutions. And I, I agree, they, 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 they can easily be false solutions and, and waste time and energy. So th that brings me to the question, what should we be doing right now if we wanted to um, cut these emissions and get where we need to be as fast as possible? Beneficial electrification of heating, beneficial electrification of transportation together with these very cost-effective renewables. The future is in electricity. Next. To me, the real challenges are educational and, and counteracting misinformation and thinking creatively about funding mechanisms, but also creatively about the, the transitional challenges. So and, I'm here it is, is we've got the tools to do it. We need to be thoughtful about how we do it. And we need to, uh, we need to move away from fossil gas. Absolutely. And if New York can make it work, then, uh, you know, it will be uh, just be an incredible uh, educational experience for the rest of the world to watch us. Right. So I, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Howarth. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much for joining us at Facer Facing Future TV as we discuss how we can tame the methane monster. Thank you. Mm -hmm.